the ASRock Extreme 4. The only thing that's extreme here is my suspicion of the extremely low price. Makes it very suspect. What did they cut? What did they do? I mean, uh, of course the pricing will have probably changed by the time we get this video live, right? I mean, come on, that's how this works, isn't it? It's like, it's like, oh yeah, this is the thing, and then something changes and the market forces shift, and then as of the time of this video, this is one of the least expensive Z370 motherboards on the market. But the adventure is to find out how ASRock managed to put the board together with such a cost savings. Because it's Z370, it'll do SLI and Crossfire, so they didn't do any shenanigans with the PCI Express lanes. I don't know, let's dive in and figure it out. Well, now I should say there are some cheaper Z370 boards out there, but this is a board where ASRock has won a lot of awards. It's gotten a lot of press and a lot of play because ASRock basically gives you everything but an insanely competitive price. They, they're trying to give you the best bang for your buck. So in a lot of ways, this board is very similar to the Z370 Fatality, also from ASRock. And this board does away with the extra LAN port some of the buttons and some of the other accessories that are actually on the printed circuit board for the, uh, the Fatality. So you get a little bit of a cost savings here. So this is a little bit less expensive than the, than the Fatality, typically. Um, and I think they've done a pretty good job keeping the essentials. Well, it's, it's more than the essentials. It's like the essentials plus plus, because I mean, at the end of the day, Z370 is for enthusiasts and people are gonna overclock, right? So I mean, how much can you really cut before it's not really a board in the same market? Well, let's take a look at the board layout and let's start with the power phase design because hey that's going to be really important for overclocking because let's face it coffee lake drinks the power it's a 12 phase power design so if you're going to push 5 gigahertz and you want to push 5 gigahertz you need a pretty strong power delivery system on the motherboard this motherboard's power delivery system it's not the absolute top shelf but it is good enough to give you 5 gigahertz on coffee lake on those six core cpus basically no problem you will need good airflow around your CPU in order to do that. So bear in mind that you need a good CPU cooler and a good set of airflow around your motherboard for whatever case you put it in because the VRMs are gonna get hot if you don't have at least some airflow. Now you will of course wanna go with the six core K parts from Intel, the 8000 series CPUs for overclocking, 8600K, 8700K. Intel may come out with more Coffee Lake SKUs in the future, but you definitely wanna do overclocking on a board like this. You would not buy this board and not overclock. That would be a waste of your money. You'd be better off to look at uh, other chipsets. Now Intel has just come out with, or is about to come out with, new lower cost chipsets that will give you no real overclocking options, but you save some money. So uh, you should buy one of those boards if you don't plan to do any overclocking. The 12 phases here really did pretty well getting our 8700K up to five gigahertz without really without really any hassle because we got an 8700K that doesn't require a crazy amount of power to get to five gigahertz. So yeah, you should definitely like the H370 if you don't plan to overclock, take a look at a, another board that's based on the H370 chipset and you'll probably save you know upwards of $50 on the motherboard. But this Z370 motherboard is so inexpensive that it's probably gonna be competitive with H370 boards from other vendors. So Z370 you can overclock, H370 cannot. So let's take a look at the connectivity here. We've got two PCI Express by 16 lanes. This is by eight by eight that are wired directly into the CPU. We have a third PCI Express by 16. That's PCI Express by four through the chipset. There's also two M.2 uh, that are PCI Express by four connected to the CPU through the chipset. There's also a special E key M.2 slot for an optional M.2 Wi-Fi up in the top left corner of the motherboard. Both of the main M.2 also have the wiring for SATA. So if you do want to use SATA, you can totally use SATA M.2 modules should you find yourself with a SATA M.2 module. Now the M.2 placement on this motherboard in terms of like physically where the M.2 slots are on this motherboard is some of the best M.2 placement that you can expect on a motherboard. One is at the, at the midpoint of the board, just above the graphics card and below the CPU. So you're gonna get a lot of airflow from around the CPU socket area and the graphics card is not gonna block that. You're also gonna get a lot of airflow from the other M.2 in terms of it being located on the front edge of the motherboard. So if you have a second graphics card, it could still be a little bit of an issue, but that M.2 is so much closer to the front fans that you might have in a case. Those are really the best locations on a motherboard for M.2. So good job ASRock for putting the M.2s in the pretty much best possible locations on a motherboard like this to maximize airflow over your M.2 devices. 
Now at the rear, we've got our antenna connections, a combo PS2 mouse keyboard port, VGA, DVI, and HDMI for the Intel iGPU. And if you're wondering, that HDMI port can only do 4K at 30 hertz. Sorry, that's just the nature of an iGPU. There's also an Asmedia 3142 USB 3.1 Gen 2 controller with one Type-A and one Type-C at the back of the board. That is USB 3.1 Gen 2, so it's 10 gigabit. We've also got two more USB 3.1 Gen 1 ports just under the Intel Gigabit Ethernet port. For the audio, you've got a Realtek ALC1220 based 7.1 audio codec with optical SPDIF implemented as Purity Sound 4 and implementing the DTS Connect protocol. It does advertise 120 dB signal to noise ratio. It uses Nishikon fine gold audio capacitors. And the front panel uh, input, or the front panel IO connection, I'm not really sure what to call that, like the front panel audio connector, supports uh, auto impedance sensing. So if you have like a 600 ohm headset, it'll impedance match to deal with the 600 ohm headset and can drive that headset appropriately, which is nice. It's a good, good job, ASRock. For the audio amplifiers, it's any 5532s from Texas Instruments. So those are nice low noise amplifiers. It's pretty good for a motherboard audio implementation. So not bad. Again, looking for what ASRock compromised on here and not really seeing a lot. And finally, on extra USB connections and headers, it does have one USB 3.1 Gen 1 uh, Type-C front panel connection, two 30-pin USB 3.1 Gen 1 connections, so that's four Type-A ports for your front panel, basically. And then there's also three extra USB 2.0 headers for internal connections, internal devices. Maybe you've got an all-in-one closed-loop cooler like this NZXT or like a, like a Corsair that plugs into a USB header. You can totally do that. The memory setup is as you'd expect on this motherboard. There are four DDR4 DIMM slots. Does advertise support up to DDR4 4200, which is kind of mind blowing. The fastest memory that I have is DDR4 3600, and that's on a good day. In terms of other connectivity, this motherboard does have a Thunderbolt header. If you're into Thunderbolt, you can do Thunderbolt. Although you should probably go for the Titan Ridge as opposed to the older Alpine Ridge if you have a choice about what type of Thunderbolt card you get for the thing if you're going to get a Thunderbolt card. You'd use that in the PCI Express by 4 expansion slot that's on the uh, bottom edge of the motherboard if you were going to go for that uh, Thunderbolt connectivity. So in short, what is it with this motherboard? I can't really tell that they cut much to save on price. I mean, they did something. Seems pretty solid. If you're curious about Linux support, well, this motherboard works well with Linux too. You can run Linux to your heart's content. You can set the RGB and the fan profiles directly from the UEFI, so you don't need a utility for that to work with. And the IOMMU groups on this motherboard are pretty solid as well. After the outro, there's a full tour of the UEFI if you're interested. If you end up using one of these in a build, do share with us in picture form in the forums at Level 1 Techs. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.